Thank you, John. Good morning again. Keep your Bibles open, please. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we long to hear your voice this morning. Please talk to us and help us. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All that is dark is now in retreat. The glorious life of light, Jesus Christ, the Son of Righteousness, has risen. On that first resurrection day, his bright radiance, the luminous goodness and brightness of God without cloud or shadow, no threat, the burning bright of his new resurrection reality, poured out of the grave into the night. And all that is dark is now in retreat. That moment in history was the moment that changed everything. The last enemy of death was the drumbeat of life, inexorably possessing us, drawing us down, advancing upon us. The darkness was thick and all-consuming. Ruin and war and strife and envy. There was no hope on the horizon, no light to push back the fall. Death's march was ultimate, withering all life and goodness away, overcoming all peace and all joy. The pitiless, unyielding rule of sin and death and hell, ruined and broke and poisoned and spoiled and veiled the world for millennia. Until that moment when the Son of God was raised in power. At his resurrection, Jesus was declared victor. The verdict had been passed. Death had been defeated. Darkness was now on the run. The drumbeat has stopped. The king has been victorious. All that is dark is now in retreat. Now the light is advancing. And we live on the edge of the dawn. Whether you're a Christian here this morning or you're not, we live on the burning edge of the dawn. A new inevitability, a new irreversible reality is now upon us. There is a kingdom of darkness, but its reign is over. We face this new inevitability, the sweet dawn chorus, a hopeful reality, the kingdom of Jesus Christ. His kingdom is here now, advancing and pushing back the fall, chasing away the hopelessness and darkness and brokenness of this passing age. As churches are planted, as the gospel is preached, the golden light of King Jesus is taking over. This light and dark battle is not some Star Wars style dualistic battle where we don't know which side is going to win. No, it's been decided. The enemy has been disarmed. As surely as the sun rose this morning, banishing all the night, so certain are we of the ultimate banishing of the dominion of darkness. And so John here, in his epistle and in this chapter, he keeps on reminding his church family of the light and warning of the dark. The darkness is fading. The old world is passing away. It's sinking. It's dying. It's losing. So stay away from it. You can't go back to that. You've turned from the darkness. That's what repentance is. You've totally changed direction. You're now to bring in the light. This is your new purpose. The dawn is coming, so stay in the light. That's the thrust of, of this chapter. That's the thrust of John's whole epistle. Stay in the light. But I want to focus this morning really just on one verse, which is the fulcrum of the whole book and of our text this morning. Rather than expound all those verses for us, I want us to focus on the second half of verse 8. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy 
the works of the devil. This is why we live in the light and not in the dark. The dark world of evil has been destroyed by the Son of God. So don't hang out there. Don't abide in the place where Jesus is pressing down his judgment. Stay in the light. So let's consider what that verse means for us. Why it's such an amazing verse. Think of light and think of dark. Think of God and think of the devil. God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. Light holds no secrets, does it? God is one who reveals what he is up to. He speaks openly. Jesus made himself available to be examined, to be questioned. He was questioned in courts. He was examined by priests and nobody could find any fault with him. They knew of his purity. He is open and available. He is the light and the truth. Nothing's hidden. What God says and who he is and all that he's done has been written down and it's been kept secure for us and unchanged for millennia. His word has been translated into thousands of different dialects. Such is God's desire to be known by all people. There's no holding back. There's no holding back. That's what light is like. God's word is clear and available. And he even appoints witnesses, heralds, preachers to declare and carry on declaring who he is and what he's done. He is so committed, in fact, to this program of constantly pouring out truth into the world that he has appointed the whole universe to testify to his truth day and night. But this is not the way of the devil. This is not what happens in the darkness. The devil hides himself. He really doesn't want to be found or known for who he is. He lives in the shadows where his deeds can be concealed away. There's nothing public or open or available about him. Jesus speaks of him as a liar, a deceitful murderer from the beginning. There is no spark of good in him. There's no inner core of mercy that can be appealed to. He has no redeeming features whatsoever. He is a wolf dressed as a sheep. He disguises himself. He disguises himself as an angel of light when he is, in fact, the darkest of all. He's a master of deception. So much so that if you were to survey a, a, a normal town like Worthing and maybe look around at our cultural artifacts, our stories, our films, we hear this idea that the only really evil people in our world are the murderers and the child molesters. Only the most despotic figures in human history would ever be described as under the control of Satan. So the vast majority of the world sleeps safely under the illusion that the devil and evil only exist at the very fringes of society, only among the truly twisted criminals. Absolutely no person out there really thinks that their lives are serving Satan. Outside of Christ, we would have to say his deception is comprehensive, masterful. Because that is not the picture of the devil that the Bible gives. God doesn't leave it up to fiction writers and dodgy so-called spiritualists to imagine what the devil is like. Or even just ordinary people and their ideas about it. The reality is actually far, far worse than even the most depraved imagination could fancy. Listen to what God says about the devil and the scope of his work and then we'll see why verse 8 is such a tremendously hopeful verse. So in the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, Paul is speaking about the, the, the depth of mankind's predicament outside of Christ, what the world is really like outside of Jesus. And he's saying to these Christians in Ephesus, before they were saved, before they were in Christ and under Christ, before you were saved, you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, 
following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in those who are disobedient. So Paul says there that that Satan rules the world, the world meaning not the universe itself, but the, the, the corrupt fallen human society. There in Ephesians 2, we learn that behind all the temptations and corruptions of the world is the devil, the ruler, the prince, who organizes the world and arranges things according to his godless purposes. So this is why when Jesus comes into the world, we read in in John chapter 1 verse 10 that even though it's his world, he made it, his hallmark runs right through everything and, and even us as image bearers, yet the devil has so blinded the world that even when Jesus comes into the world, we're like, well, who are you supposed to be? 2 Corinthians 4 4 explains this further. It says, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. We learn that the devil there is described as the God of this world. That is a terrifying title. His power is such that he's blinded people's minds so that they cannot see the light of the glory of the gospel of Christ. In John 12, verse 31, John 14, verse 30, and in 16, 11, the devil is likewise described as the ruler of the world. So the true living God, revealing God, the light, the, the powerful God, is hidden from his own creatures by the devil. His own world that he made is now ruled and controlled by the evil one. And since he is described as the God of this world, all those who are outside of Christ serve him and worship him with their blinded minds and eyes. As long as they remain blind to Christ, the true revelation of God, the image of God, the devil is happy. So whether they worship him directly or by serving some other so-called God or, or just by distracting themselves with life, consumed by consuming, so long as they're blind to Christ, the devil is happy. This is why Paul ends the book of Ephesians with that famous call to battle. That our battle is not ultimately against human opposition to the gospel. That really is just the front to what is really going on. Which is that the devil and his angels have sway over the world. Ephesians 6.12 For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness. Against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Some Christians have mistakenly tried to take these powers on, thinking that maybe, you know, Worthing would suddenly become Christian if the the, the spiritual force binding Worthing could be dealt with. But that's not the way the apostles or the prophets combated these powers. They preached the gospel. That is our only weapon in this war, as Paul makes clear there in Ephesians 6. Now, maybe we're wondering, if God is the true God, the God of light, the God of power, the the creator of all things, how on earth did the devil ever get to become so powerful and become the God of this age, the ruler of this world? It's a good question, but it has a horrific, horrific answer. We handed him the power. We crowned him the prince of this age. Humanity did it. We gave him the place of God of this world. You see, in the beginning, the great God of light and goodness, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, he gave us the universe. Here you go. Here's a wonderful garden. Here's a wonderful place. Here's the whole world. It's all yours for you to have dominion over. You are to protect it. You are to keep it. You are to nurture it and plant it and love it. This is your world. 
God gave it to us. And then we handed it over to the devil. When the human race said no to the word of the Lord in Genesis 3, we did not gain autonomy. We were not set free to be who we want to be. No, we exchanged the glorious liberty of Christ for the shameful slavery of Satan. The devil has no natural right to this world, but we gave it to him. We gave him the rule and we gave him the power when we followed his words rather than the word of God. In C.S. Lewis's uh, book, Out of the Silent Planet, it's a bit of a spoiler if you intend to read it, but in the book, the reason that the earth is called the silent planet is because it is veiled and controlled by the evil one. And so the angels, that there is no conversation going on between the earth and the heavenly creatures. The earth is silent. The God of this world, the bent one, has suppressed the sound of the voice of Christ. Even though the devil has become the God of this world. You know the Bible verse, John 3.16. For God so loved the world... He gave his only begotten son that whoever would believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Even though we couldn't hear from God, we didn't want to hear from God, there was no speech, there was no conversation between man and heaven. It was all suppressed beneath the rule of the prince of this world. God still loved the world. He still loved us though we were dead in sin and transgression. We were his mortal enemies, yet he set his love upon the sons of men. The devil's work from the garden onwards was to undermine the word of God, to kill humanity, to spread death and ruin, to destroy the good works of God. And viewed independently from Christ, we'd have to say what a complete job he's done of it. Yet, the Son of God appeared to undo the devil's work. That's what verse 8 is telling us. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. Now, let's just think about how he did that for a few minutes. And let's rejoice in it. This is good news. Hebrews 2 verse 14 says that since therefore the children, that's us, share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise took, partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil. Since it was humanity who gave the devil such great power, it had to be a human who would come and remove that power. Since humanity had been given dominion, we had been made responsible for the world by God. It therefore had to be a human life that shouldered the responsibility of putting all things right, do you see? But since the whole of humanity, the humanity of Adam, had fallen under the power of the devil... A new human life was needed, one that was truly flesh and blood like us, but actually a new kind of human was needed, a, a human life that's not under the control of Satan, one who is able to break through that thick mantle that has created this silence, one who could come from heaven and open up that way again, one who was truly our flesh and blood in the full sense but a new human. Think of it. A human life that is not under the power of the devil. A human life. A human that knows, truly knows the Father. Who can speak freely with the Father. And that communication can, can open up through him. A human life which is completely uncorrupted. A true human. A life which the devil has no hold over. Imagine it. Jesus tells us just before his crucifixion, John 14, verse 30, the ruler of this world is coming, but he has no hold over me. 
He was that man. He was the right man. But as 1 John 3 verse 8, our verse, reminds us, the one born to destroy the works of the devil was no less than the Son of God. God didn't simply raise up a, 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 an Adam that was identical to the first one who would simply just fall away again under the power of the devil. No, the second Adam would be divine with all the power and authority to destroy the devil's works. He would come from heaven to punch through that veil and to open the way back up. The one who destroyed the works of the devil was himself the union of God and man. God didn't leave this work up to a, a mere creature, no matter how grand that creature may be. God himself joins the ranks of humanity to take on the devil. Though only a human could undo humanity's sin, yet humanity could not destroy the devil's work. Only God could do that. The human race has no power over the devil. We gave it to him. Therefore, it had to be the very Son of God who would come and destroy the works of the devil. And so that's what he did. He came to us, born of the Virgin Mary, one of us, but fully God, not like us, in that he was not under the control of Satan. The God-man comes and makes his stand in the devil's own backyard. The hardest, most dangerous, most difficult place on earth to resist the devil's temptations. Luke 4, verse 1, we see the, the Holy Spirit leading Jesus out into the wilderness to confront the devil. A desolate place, a lifeless place. Now, when humanity first met the devil, it was in the glorious Garden of Eden. Mankind was surrounded by the manifest goodness of God. Then it was the devil who was very much playing away. Surely you'd say that would be the hardest place to convince man to forsake God, surrounded by his manifest goodness and glory. The odds seemed stacked against the devil, but he succeeded, and humanity wickedly joined his rebellion. So Jesus meets the devil in a barren and lifeless infertile dry place of death he meets him surrounded by the manifest works of the devil lifelessness in the beginning satan only needed one temptation to destroy the human race and to seize our power but jesus here he tries three times to find a weakness in christ and he fails each time he is the right man. He is God's choice. Each of Satan's temptations were brilliant in their cunning, but each time were kicked immediately into touch by Jesus through his total confidence in the word of God. In Adam, we disobeyed the word of God at the first test, but Jesus holds fast to the word of God through every test. And from then on, it's like all hell has broken loose against Jesus. There's demonic possession everywhere, so much evil in the world. But Jesus, the God-man, he drives that darkness away as he heals and as he, he, he preaches. His light is now pushing back the darkness and the majesty of his glory is tormenting the devil and his angels. They're on the run. But the real defeat of the devil came at the death of of Christ on the cross. And this is an incredible paradox. This is mind-blowing. When Jesus is killed, that is when the devil is defeated. You see, at that moment, human sin was, was judged and punished. And the old humanity, the old order was put to death. The old way, the way of darkness, the way of disbelief, the way of the rejection of God's word, of handing power over to Satan by humanity, it was killed in Christ. The light destroyed this great darkness. Humanity's evil choice for Satan, well, it was reversed at the cross for all who would come to Christ. The devil had held the power of death, but he overstretched himself 
And in killing God, he lost the power of death. The living one entered his lair. The light descended into that ultimate place of darkness. And though Jesus became sin for us, he himself knew no sin and the power of death could not hold him because none of the sin was his. So that place of ultimate darkness was now flooded with his light. The strong man's dungeon was no longer under his control. Who holds the power of death today? Revelation 1 17. Jesus tells the Apostle John, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died and behold I am alive forevermore and I have the keys of death and Hades. Yes, death is swallowed up in the victory of the God-man. Death could not and did not contain him. The mouth of the tomb shouts glory. The groom is alive. The devil's power is forever broken at the cross and resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. And he's given to us, his bride, he's given to his people ultimate authority now to plunder the world over which the devil rules. Though we were once slaves of the devil, his subjects, his children. Now, through faith in Jesus Christ, we are called the children of God. 1 John 3 verse 1. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called the children of God. And so we are. The devil cannot command our obedience any longer. He can blind our eyes no more because we walk in the light of Christ. The light that the devil can only shrink away from. It's so hopeful. It's such glorious news for mankind. Verse 2. Beloved, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. We live on the burning edge of this dawn. So everyone who thus hopes in him, it says, purifies himself as he is pure. So although we live in the world and Satan is still the God of this world, yet we don't need to fear him any longer. James 4 verse 7 says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. The strong man is bound. His house can be plundered. So let's set ourselves to plundering the devil's kingdom. If the splendor of this world's kingdoms belong to the devil, let's carry them all away for the glory of Christ. The devil cannot stand against the gospel of Christ. The devil cannot resist the power of the Holy Spirit. The devil cannot lock the doors of Hades against the church of Jesus Christ. We can take it all. By the appearing of Jesus, the Son of God, evil is vanquished and the devil is dethroned. Let us therefore live in the light. Let us promote the light. Let us radiate that goodness and light from ourselves. Let's put to death the deeds of the flesh. Let us wage war with the gospel of peace. Darkness has met its end in Jesus. It is in retreat. And we're in command now. With God as our captain, let us plunder the world for Christ. Amen.